What we know from the research is that teenagers care what parents think. They care what their parents think. And when adults maintain open lines of communication and articulate their values and offer themselves as partners in safety, what we know is it actually has a meaningful impact on adolescent behavior. That was Lisa Damore on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are three clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, author of Act Daily Journal, The Act Daily Card Deck, and the upcoming book, Act for Burnout. I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist, assistant professor at Brown University, and author of the book, Work, Parent, Thrive. And from coastal New England, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty, The Big Book of Act Metaphors, and the upcoming Imposter No More. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Hi, this is Debbie, and I'm here today with Yael. We are introducing an interview that I did with Lisa Damore, and it was such a delight to talk to Lisa Damore because she is a leading voice in adolescence. Actually, it's funny because not too long ago, I was I had NPR on my clock radio because I don't like to have a phone. Neck. I don't like to use my phone for a little alarm clock, so I have NPR. And I hear this conversation about teenagers and adolescents, and I was like, that's Lisa Damore. She's just, her voice is everywhere. She has three terrific books. And it was pretty cool for me because I got to consult with her about some of my concerns about adolescence and ask my friends to ask her questions. Um, so what an honor to have her on. I was really excited to sneak a question in there, too, because I, first of all, am a huge fan of Lisa Damore and love her writing and her wisdom. And I am also the parent of a newly minted teenager. As of just a couple of days ago, my oldest turned 13. So for me, it was really fun to get to pick the brain of this expert in this area. But one thing I do want to say, and I this is part of why I love Lisa's work so much, is that I absolutely worship my 13-year-old. And there's so much conversation about how tough teens are and how difficult they are. And I may eat my words at some point, but I, you know, my kid is, you know, plenty annoying, but he's also so wonderful. And I love that she makes teenagers feel much more friendly and accessible and really reduces the anxiety that we as parents can have because there is so much unhelpful mythology around what it means to have a teenager. And and again, I just think the way that she approaches this developmental phase is just so much more helpful than, than the fear mongering that can otherwise happen. Yeah, she kind of takes some of the things that people are afraid of with adolescents and teenagers and helps you understand it and then have some ideas of, okay, this might be a helpful way to respond to this. And of course, not all teenagers are the same. So you may or may not see specific behaviors, but I think it really helps to be like, okay, I see what's going on here. Because sometimes, you know, as parents, we, or just anyone interacting with a teenager, we don't know what to do with these creatures and (laughs) might feel a little confused by them. Um, But in some ways, you know, if you think of it as that transition from childhood where there's a lot of dependency, and then by the end of adolescence, you know, they're on their own. I talked to Louise Hayes about this on a previous episode, how much change happens just during those teenage years. It's like, wow, no wonder, you know, there's a lot going on developmentally during those years because there's just so much happening. Yeah. and, And because our kids are going through so much transition and change it means that we as parents have to go through a lot of transition and change. And so having this guidance from her, you know, that is really science-based and thoughtful and nuanced is just so helpful because along with our kids, you know, we, you know, if our kids are changing by that very nature, we need to change too, right? And how we approach them, interact with them, what we expect from them. And again, one of the things I really love about this is that there is a lot of nuance. Like one of the examples that she gives later on in the interview is about the specific uh, worry that a lot of parents have about their kids on on screens, on video games or, or whatever other kinds of screens. And I love that she sort of gives permission, like just as an adult at the end of a long, exhausting day might want a way to sort of decompress and turn off, our kids do too. And that it's not a problem per se for them to be on a screen. It's more 
the way that we use those decompressing tools. And if we use them rigidly and excessively, that's a problem. But if we use them to kind of decompress and then we're able to sort of go back and be productive or do whatever else needs to be done, that it's actually a very productive tool. And I I love that nuance that she introduces to it. That was helpful for me with my mom guilt when at the end of the day, I'm trying to finish my work and I give my kids permission. They're home from school. They're exhausted. I let them you know, watch something on their iPad or something like that. And I feel a little guilty, but it's like, they really are kind of, you know, school days are long and exhausting. So they need to unwind a little bit. So now I feel less guilt. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I do too. Like, and, and we talk about it as, as a family, like, okay, you've had a hard day. Would would it be restful for you to have a little screen time? And they'll say yes. And we have a rule in my house that is, you know, we can use the screens and then when it's time for dinner, as long as you can get off of them, then there's no issue, right? You can use it tomorrow and the day after, but that it's all about building the flexibility. That is the goal that we, as long as we can use it flexibly, then we're not going to worry too much about it. And one of the things that I was able to ask her about that you'll hear toward the end of the episode are two patterns that you sometimes see with teenagers. One is when they're sort of underachieving or disengaging with school. You know, maybe it's a bright kid who's always done, who's always engaged with schoolwork, who suddenly just wants nothing to do with school, refuses to do homework, skips class or whatever the case may be. Um, And then on the other side are kids who are sort of or I should say, are teenagers or adolescents who are sort of overly overachieving, who are really stressed all the time and anxious. When we think about the underachieving end of the spectrum, I wanted to point out to listeners who might be interested in this topic that this is something that we've covered. Actually, we've sort of covered both of these topics in the podcast in the past. We'll link to some episodes. And one that came to mind was a book called The Self-Driven Child that, and this was several years ago that we had this interview on the podcast, which is really about, you know, if you're constantly battling with your kid or teenager to engage with schoolwork and they're just refusing to, you know, how do you get them to be sort of self-motivated and engaged? Um, So we'll link to that on the show notes for today's episode for anyone who's interested. Um, And I also wanted to just say a little bit, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about either of these, Yael, but um, she talks about, you know, with the kids who are almost like overly ambitious, overly stressed out, who are taking on everything under the sun and then are stressed out and anxious all the time. And it's concerning, I think, sometimes from a mental health standpoint when when kids are going that direction. And she talks about this skill of we, if you have a kid like that, they know how to work hard, right? But the skill that they might need your help with is how to know when to not work, when to say, this isn't important to me, I'm not going to spend my time on it, or maybe, oh, you know, I'm going to take an easier class instead of this really hard one, or I'm going to get a less than perfect grade on this so that I can have time to do this other thing that's important to me. And I was so struck by that because I work with adults with stress and burnout and anxiety. And that skill is hard for so many of it. And I had never really thought about it that way before I read her work and talked to her about how that is as important as teaching them the academic piece and teaching them the hard work piece is teaching them that distinction. Yeah, teaching them that distinction and teaching them how to kind of tune into their own cues, like how tired am I? How important is this to me versus, you know, how important is it to other people? And I'm just sort of following along with the the herd mentality. And what I think is so important to think about in the teen years is that it's sort of the breeding ground for adulting skills and that this is really an opportunity for us as parents, as as, as guides who hopefully have developed some of these skills, but but also recognizing that most of us, for most of us, we are, we are still working on some of these skills too. But to recognize that the teen years are really a time and a place to start to learn some of these practices of figuring out what's working for me? Am I too tired? Am I taking on too much? Am I not taking on enough? How do I know what are my cues? And to make that a part of helping your kid learn how to make decisions for themselves. So not taking the decision away from them, but sort of pointing out to them that this is an opportunity for them to try to kind of tune in and make some of those decisions that are going to be healthy and sustainable and practices that they can take with them into adulthood. Yeah. So take a listen to this episode where we talk about these kind of topics and so many more and get some of the wisdom and practical advice from Dr. Lisa Damore. 
If you pay attention to adolescent mental health, you've probably heard of my guest today. Dr. Lisa Damore is the author of three New York Times bestsellers, Untangled, Under Pressure, and her new book, The Emotional Lives of Teenagers. She co-hosts the Ask Lisa podcast, works in collaboration with UNICEF, and is recognized as a thought leader by the American Psychological Association. Dr. Damore graduated with honors from Yale University and earned her doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Michigan. Dr. Damore serves as a senior advisor to the Schubert Center for Child Studies at Case Western Reserve University and has written numerous academic papers, chapters, and books related to education and child development. She maintains a clinical practice and also speaks to schools, professional organizations, and corporate groups around the world on the topics of child and adolescent development, family mental health, and adult well-being. She also has the lived experience. She and her husband are the proud parents of two daughters. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm a big fan of your work, um, and I, I want to kind of I'm trying to decide which questions is I ask you because I have so many and I have all these friends who have either teenagers or tweens and I asked them for questions and I got almost like inundated. With <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to, best to hit some of the highlights from your work. Um, starting with this, you know, teenagers, I think sometimes almost scare people a little bit when you see a group of teenagers or even if you're a parent and you're approaching the teenage years or, or in the middle of them. Um, because there's so many changes and so much going on with adolescents. And so I'm wondering if you could tell us, you know, where do you think teenagers get this kind of reputation? And do you think they deserve it? Well, I agree with you that people can be very anxious around teenagers. Um, I also think there's sort of a bias often against teenagers. And in terms of the where the reputation comes from, I think there's a few things. One is... Um, Teenagers are extraordinarily perceptive. They, I think it is much harder to pull the wool over the eyes of a teenager than it is of a child or an adult. Teenagers have a very strong gut sense and awareness of things. And I think that um, they can have an almost kind of x-ray vision quality that I think can make adults uneasy. Um, teenagers very quickly have the number of adults. And, and, and I think that not all adults think that's great. <laughs> so I think there's yeah. that issue. Um, I also think that there's a there's an, a way in which humans are inclined toward prejudice. I think they it's just a very um, natural, if unappealing, aspect of what it means to be human. And I think in civilized society, we work very hard against most prejudices. You know, we work very hard not to hold biases based, and rightly so, work hard at this, not to hold biases based on race, religion, skin color, ethnicity. But I think you can still be cranky about teenagers and get away with it. And if we think about the mechanism, one of the mechanisms that we think fuels bias and prejudice, it's this idea of, um, projecting unwanted aspects of oneself onto a group that looks different enough that one can say, see, it's them, not me, and then accusing them of those things. So what I mean is, I think that it may sometimes be the case that adults who are uneasy with their own intense emotions or interest in you know, sexuality or aggressive wishes or wishes to engage in risky behavior, they may feel uncomfortable with those things themselves may say, you know, teenagers, so they are so like, you know, sex crazed and aggressive and, you know, impulsive and, oh, I can't stand this about them. And it's sort of a way of saying, see, that's them, not me. And the way that we know it's them, not me is, see, I'm a middle-aged person and they're a teenager. So clearly we are different. So clearly this belongs to them. So I think there aren't a lot of socially acceptable biases against groups. And yet adolescents continue to be a group that in polite society, we can still be wholesale prejudiced against. Mm, that's a really good point. And I think that you're right. People don't really bat an eyelash when you say these kinds of comments about teenagers. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. those crazy teenagers. Yeah. Or you know teenagers yeah. or whatever. I mean, you can't say that about any other group, nor should you. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I have two girls and, and they're kind of getting, they're approaching. I, I would say that one has probably started adolescence. They're approaching their teenage years. And I know you have two daughters yourself and people sometimes say like, oh, the teen, you know, almost as if it's going to be this terrible period of time. And that's where I get a little bit like, oh, I hope it's not as bad as they're telling me it's going to be. I don't think it will be, but you know, it's a little scary when you hear people say that kind of comment. It is. And the opening, I, I have this in com- committed to memory, the opening sentence of Untangled is, we need a new way to talk about teenage girls because the way we do it now is not fair to girls or helpful to their parents. Right. Yes, absolutely. And I'm hoping to ask you a little bit more about that in the interview too, um, as we go. Um, one of the things about teenagers that I think sometimes well, it's it's the topic of your new book, The Emotional Life of Teenagers. And also it's one of the things that I think contributes to this feeling is their, you know, their emotions and how sometimes their emotions can be strong. I think they're going through some changes in terms of their emotional development. Um, so I was wondering, you know, is that is that just a myth or do you think that that's true of teenagers and what's happening developmentally, emotionally during this stage? Well, so that is true that adolescents experience emotions more um, vividly than children do and than adults do. And it's very much a function of their neurological development, that their brains are remodeling, becoming faster and more powerful and more efficient. And the remodeling process happens in the order in which the brain initially developed, which is from the lower order regions towards the back of the brain that house the emotions up to the higher order regions towards the front of of the brain that houses the perspective maintaining systems. And so there is always for teenagers a juncture where their emotion centers have been upgraded and yet their ability to maintain perspective centers have not yet been upgraded. And so when they get stirred up, it's a very intense experience for them and also for the people around them and their ability to maintain perspective or see things, you know, in a calmer way is just compromised as a function of where they sit developmentally. But I think this again gets to a place where we can bring more nuance to what are often kind of broadly dismissive comments about teenagers or just not altogether accurate and also negative comments. So, you know, you hear all the time people saying, you know, teenagers in their brains, like they're not fully developed till they're 24, 25. All right, technically that is accurate because what we think is that it's it takes until about 24, 25 for the entire renovation process to be complete and for the, emo- the perspective maintaining systems to be as upgraded as every other part of the brain. But what we think is, well, when teenagers are calm, when their emotion centers are not amped up, they reason great and they reason as well as adults. And I also think It's so funny to me when people are like, oh, teenagers, their brains aren't really developed. I'm like, "Um, did you see that AP English paper that Junior wrote? (laughs) Did you see this extraordinary work of art that, you know, this this high school sophomore created? Like, that's not a developed brain? Like, then what's happening here, right? So I think I always want to try to bring some nuance to that idea and just say, yeah, unless they're very upset, they reason beautifully. It's only when they become stirred up that their perspective maintaining systems can be knocked offline more readily than can happen in adulthood. Well, actually, I'm going to weave in a question that I was planning to ask you a little bit later, but it's about that idea of, um, you know, I guess being able to make a a smart decision when they are revved up, right? So you, one of the things in your book is this idea of hot and cold cognition. Um, Could you say a little bit about that and how maybe parents because I kind of want to weave in some some concrete ideas yep. of things people can do. So how might parents use that to help prepare them for situations where maybe they're, you know, in the heat of the moment? Absolutely. So we do make this distinction between hot and cold cognition. And cold cognition is exactly the circumstance I described, which is the kid is calm. So maybe it's Friday afternoon, you know, you're in your kitchen seeing your kid after school and you're like, Hey, what are your plans for the evening? And they're like, ah, I'm going to this party. And you're like, Hey, we know that house. Like there's going to be drinking. And your kid's like, I know. And you know what? I'm not drinking. Like it's too dicey. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm, I'm not drinking. It's, that's my plan. And they are at ease. They are not surrounded by their peers. They're not in the heat of a social moment and they're telling the truth. 
And I think that's important, that the kid means what they say in those moments. What we can contrast that with is hot cognition, which is when reasoning is informed by a very charged social or emotional experience. So here we go, right? Like in terms of the ability of the emotion centers to outmatch the reasoning centers. So then what can happen is that same kid gets to the party where they really walk in with no intention of drinking. And then they get there and they're like, oh, the kid I have a crush on is here. Hey, the kid I have a crush on is asking me if I want to drink, right? Like, okay, I'll have a drink, right? Like that they, you know, other forces take over and now they're not doing what they thought they were going to do. So adults need to account for this, that teenagers really have two different operating systems when it comes to decision making. And those operating systems are going to be informed by how stirred up they feel by what's going on. And the best we can do, and this is not a perfect solution, but it's it's worth a shot, is under cold conditions, plan for hot conditions. So when the kid at four o'clock is like, yeah, 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 and I'm going to that party, I'm not going to drink. The adult should say, great, we agree, we think you're safer if you don't, but let's talk it through. Let's say you get there and everyone's drinking, or let's say you get there and the kid you have a crush on, you know, offers you a drink. What's the plan? Like, what are you going to do in that moment to stick with what we're agreeing to right now, which is that you're not going to drink and have the kid play it out. Like, I'll tell them that, I, you know, I'll drive, I'll be the one who's driving, right? So why don't I drive tonight? And then I'll say, I can't because I'm driving. Or I'll tell them that you breathalyze me when I, you know, like something. It doesn't even have to be true. Mm-hmm. What you don't want is a kid in a hot condition trying to make a decision on the fly. And so to try to prevent that is really the goal. You know, I, as a clinician, I only work with adults, but I sometimes do that with adult clients too, because maybe they're working on better communication with their partner or an emotion skill of some kind. And it's like, well, let's practice it now when things are pretty calm and cool and then get better at it. And so that, you know, then when your emotions are off the charts, you have a, you're more practiced, you know what to do and you can think it through in a way that's really hard to do. I think when, for all of us, when emotions are running hot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like you don't want to back yourself into that corner. Right. So you offer some different myths of emotions in your book. And I think one that I really want to hone in on here, and I think listeners to the podcast will, this will sound familiar because we talk about this a lot, but just this idea that, that difficult emotions are bad for us or should be avoided, avoided. And I think sometimes as parents, we might think that for teenagers, right? Like, oh, it's, we don't want them to go through distress. We don't want them to feel emotions, but you really argue that that's, that's not a helpful way to look at it. Could you say a little bit more about the harm of, of, of that myth? Sure. And, and I think, you know, if we go back to how potent adolescent emotions can be, I have a lot of empathy for the parent who's looking at their kid having a full-on meltdown in the kitchen And a lot of empathy for the parent thinking, this can't be good, and this is maybe harming my kid. And and I think, I haven't heard it articulated so directly, but I often feel like it's very helpful to say, I think parents worry that if their teenager becomes very, very upset, it will hurt their kid. And, And it's such a concrete thing, and I think it's really true, but we don't say it that directly. And so the first thing I think that's important to articulate is emotions actually don't damage people with one exception. And that exception is trauma, that we do recognize that there are experiences that happen to people that are so overwhelming that they outmatch that person's coping. And we call, that's, what, that's what a trauma is. Um, it's not the event itself. It's that whatever the event is, just absolutely overwhelms their ability to cope with it and does do lasting damage. Like we know that, like the trauma can cause harm. It can rewire the nervous system, which doesn't mean the nervous system can't get re-rewired, but it, it just, it's, it's a problem. So we have to be mindful about preventing trauma. Like nobody, trauma is good for nobody. And if psychologists could prevent all trauma, of course, you know, we would. But most things are not trauma. Most things are just very upsetting. And It's important that we, the adults around teenagers, can get used to the idea or work to get used to the idea that experiencing emotional distress is not only not damaging to your kid, 
it's usually growth giving. It's what they are, as humans, we are all designed to withstand quite a bit of emotional distress. And what we're really interested in is how well do they cope and can they bring good coping on board? Can they turn to good coping themselves? Can they, you know, ask people for support in coping? That's really what we're interested in. But I'll tell you that um, I, I had the most wonderful experience last week. I was speaking virtually to a high school and um, arranged, and this is such a fun thing to do, arranged with the school, it was to the high school seniors, that the students would all have their phones with them and we would send them a link to a Google Doc that I had access to. And I would talk with them a little bit about the transition to college because this was a group of high school seniors and they were, it's like largely a population that's headed off to college. And then after I talked with them for a while, they could use their phones to enter questions into the Google Talk. And so I saw them on my computer popping up and I could answer them in real time. And so it was anonymous. Oh, so cool. It was super yeah. cool. And it was, I could see who the questions were coming from, but I don't know these kids. Um, but I, And I wouldn't give the name of the question, but that way everybody could ask a question without feeling the least bit embarrassed about their question in front of their peers. And one question, which for some reason I strongly suspect it came from a boy, and I was like, this is part of why I do this, is if you, otherwise boys don't ask questions in groups. And this this really opens up the doors. And one kid, I don't know why I thought it was a boy, said, um, I'm afraid my dog is going to die while I'm in college. And what do I do? You know, and, and I said to the whole audience, I read the question, I said, here's the thing, if your dog dies, you're going to be really sad. And that's what you're supposed to feel. And it's not going to harm you to feel those feelings. And your job is to take good care of yourself and find healthy ways to cope with those feelings. Okay, now you and I both know I am saying nothing but the most basic, well-established views from academic and clinical psychology. They sound revolutionary only because the culture has adopted such a defensive posture toward distress. But that was how I handled it with this particular student. And it really does feel like I'm getting way too much credit right now for saying what it is we know to be true about how emotions operate. That is such a sweet story. I Isn't love it that just, story. I mean, they're just question. so great. One yeah. kid tried to get me to do his promposal. It was really, <laughs> it was awesome. Oh, that's adorable. It's adorable. <laughs> adorable. Uh, well, and I do think, you know, one of the things that's in your book that's really helpful are some strategies that parents can use to help their their kids, their teenagers navigate some of these emotional ups and downs and learn how to do that and how to maybe take that different perspective on emotions, which you're right, it's not really that groundbreaking, but it kind of is when the culture has been telling us the opposite for so long. Um, one of the suggestions that you offer is helping them learn how to express their feelings. Um, what do you think is, what are some helpful things that parents can do for kids to learn that? So, just to back us up a few steps and then come into it. So, okay. you know, the argument I'm making in this book is that we really do need to revisit how we talk and think about mental health because where the culture has gone and where we clinicians sit, you know, very far apart from each other. So the culture's attitude, and again, I'm broad generalizations, is that you know you're mentally healthy if you feel good, you know your kid's mentally healthy if they feel good, right? Like basically as long as distress isn't in the picture. That's not what mental health is. Mental health, we know, is about having feelings that make sense and then managing those feelings well. And that can include a very wide range of extremely unpleasant emotions. But basically, where the rubber hits the road is on coping. It's not the presence or absence of distress. It's how one copes with it that is of most interest to us clinically. When psychologists think about coping, we think about emotion regulation, the ability to regulate one's emotions, and we think in two categories, that sometimes we regulate by expressing feelings, and sometimes we regulate by finding ways to control or tame emotions. The culture right now is very heavily tipped towards the first. We talk a lot about getting kids to talk about their emotions, and we'll talk about that. But I think it's important to notice also, or to note, that psychologists put these on equal footing. Like, there's a lot of value in helping kids learn how to also quiet their own emotions, soothe themselves, you know, feel that they can control 
and not just you not only have expression as their their um, option. But we do want them to express, and we know that that can be valuable. And I would tell you, I think the number one barrier, and I don't say this lightly because I don't. I'm I'm really very rarely critical. I think the number one barrier to kids expressing their emotion is how we respond when when they actually do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, we adults sit around all the time like, gosh, it would be really great if kids talk to us about their feelings. And then a kid walks in the door and they're like, oh my gosh, I had the worst day ever and I can't stand, you know, fill in the blank. And I promise you, I think 98% of the time, the response the kid is looking for is like, holy moly, that stinks. I'm so sorry. Like what a lousy day, right? Just like empathy or curiosity, like tell me more. And I would say, I'm just making up numbers, 79% of the time, instead of that, which they're actually looking for, we're like, oh, I'm sure it wasn't that bad. Or what are you talking about? Or, you know, you need to look on the bright side of things. Or, you know, why are you always so grumpy? Which the kid is like, why do I even try? (laughs) And so I think the like, like almost comical irony in this is that we're constantly saying, oh, if only teenagers would talk with us about our fe- their feelings, and that we're constantly pulled, me too, as a parent, toward advice giving or correction when they do, <laughs> which makes them yeah. wish they hadn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, yeah, we just need to be receptive and listen and, you know, yeah. Curiosity followed by empathy. That's right. like the basic <laughs> formula. And here's the thing. That doesn't mean that's where it stops. I mean, there may be a conversation where you end up giving advice or saying, you know, was there anything decent that happened today? But I'm sort of getting more and more, I'm turning into one of those mid to late career psychologists where I'm like, eh, it's all getting pretty basic and clear. So I'm like, there's some things that you just, no matter what, they're going to help and they certainly won't hurt and you should probably start with them. So for when a kid is talking about feelings, curiosity followed by empathy, almost always going to get you where you need to go. And then the other thing I'm getting more clarity on is, yeah, they just need more sleep. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yes. and again, like won't hurt, will probably help. Yeah. And some of the strategies in your book are that simple, you know, make sure they're sleeping, make that sure kind of sleeping. thing, right? Absolutely. So I think some parents are probably listening and wonder, where do we draw the line though? Because certainly there are some kids who are very depressed. There are some kids who are into some pretty scary high-risk behaviors like substance abuse and other kinds of risky behaviors. And I know some of that is normal, quote, normal too, right? Like that they they maybe have a little desire to get out in the world and do things that are a stretch. Um, Do you have thoughts about like, how do you know, is this just, okay, let's just talk about this with empathy versus should I actually be getting some professional help or, or something like that? So if we go back to the the model of like, what is mental health? It's having feelings that fit the circumstance and then handling those feelings well. So that also clarifies very, I think, directly when we're not looking at mental health. So if we just start with the feelings that fit the circumstance, psychologists like anxiety. We see anxiety as a useful protective emotion if it fits the conditions, right? So if you're driving and somebody is swerving next to you, we would like to see some anxiety because that will help you drive more safely or get away from that driver. If it is a Sunday morning and your kid's work is done, there's nothing to worry about. They should be able to relax. They finally you know, are in a good spot and they have persistent anxiety. Okay. That doesn't make sense. And we would then address that clinically. like that. We don't expect to see distress in the absence of something causing it. So that doesn't make sense for anxiety. It doesn't make sense. You know, sadness, we expect to see, you know, you're sad about something, depression, you're sad about everything. We can't necessarily attach it to a cause. So if the feeling is illogical, that's a flag. Then the other flag is, well, the feeling may make sense. Like the kid may be really anxious because they haven't done their schoolwork, but if they're coping is problematic, that's the other flag. So what we want to see if a kid's really anxious about the schoolwork they haven't done, is that they start doing their work. Like that would be a really good form of coping. What we don't want to see is them saying, well, you know what? I'll just get super high and then my anxiety won't bother me anymore. So the category I think about in terms of when to worry is there's two categories. Either the feeling does not add up, like it just doesn't fit something you know, amiss, or what I call costly coping that a kid is in distress and the way they're managing that distress is they're abusing substances or they're, you know, tearing at the fabric of relationships, they're taking it out on everyone around them, 
or they're not taking good care of themselves as a way to manage that distress, either engaging in highly risky behavior or self-harming behavior or running themselves down or feeling bleak and suicidal, right? Like that- I was thinking video games, like they're staying up all night playing video games to distract themselves, something absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's like, that. so that's a, and video games and distraction are so important because there's value in those for coping, right? A little bit can be sometimes how a kid is just like puts the day behind them. It becomes costly coping if it starts to come at the expense of other things, right? So that's, I really, in writing this book, I really came around on distraction. Like we all use distraction all the time to regulate our emotions, but, you know, 10 minutes or I don't know, probably more than 10 minutes, I mean, you know, a little video game, mm-hmm. if that helps the kid, you know, put the day in the books and then get down to their homework, that's a good use of distraction. If they get so deep into the video games that they are now behind on their homework or they're not getting enough sleep or they haven't moved or they're not seeing friends, now you're into costly coping. So they're coping, but there's a price tag attached. So that's what we want to see. It's it's not the presence or absence of distress. It's that distress fits, you know, really like we can see why the person has the feeling they have and that it is well managed. Yeah, yeah. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. So I I told you that I asked several of my friends to send questions for you. And one that came up from several people, I think, which I think is indi- is indicative, is the idea that as, as people move into adolescence and move through adolescence, peers become really important and parents might feel like they have less influence than they used to. Um, so what do you say to parents who wonder, you know, is it too late for me to have an impact on my child? Does my parenting even matter anymore? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it is true, right? That it's, it's a sign of healthy development for adolescents to loosen their ties to us and to strengthen their ties to their peers. Like we, it, it doesn't feel good all the time for the parent, but actually it's evidence that things are proceeding as they should. And it's also what lays the groundwork for things like kids being able to move out, right? So we, you know, like the, the, this is part of a larger plan. Um, what we know from the research is that teenagers care what parents think. They care what their parents think. And when adults maintain open lines of communication and articulate their values, and I think probably the, for me the most important things, offer themselves as partners in safety, and we'll come back to that, what we know is it actually has a meaningful impact on adolescent behavior, that 
when adults articulate their values, teenagers often cleave far more to those values than the adults even realize. Um, you know, when in terms of maintaining open lines of communication, you know, if the kid comes home and is like, man, there's a bunch of eighth graders, you know, getting into weed gummies. If the adult responds with like, whoa, like, I'm kind of surprised. Are you kind of surprised? Like, what are you thinking? And ke- and makes that a conversation as opposed to like, do not let me catch you, you know, or what, or, you know, very strong negative reaction. I think that can be really helpful. And I think on the the safety piece, you know, this thing I'm really thinking about all the time is we do teen we don't do safety to teenagers. We do it with teenagers because they have so much freedom and autonomy as they should. So it goes back to that conversation in the kitchen where the adult could say like, okay, but if you do go to that party and you do get drunk, like you are grounded till you're 35, that's one take on it, which is now like using threats and fear to try to get the kid to do the right thing. The other is for the adult to say, look, we're really in agreement with your planning. We also understand you get to parties and the scene changes. Your safety matters more to us than anything in the whole wide world. So A, what is the plan for how you're going to stay sober? And B, you also know that if things don't go the way we're planning and you don't feel safe, we are here to help you and we will never make you sorry that you've asked for our help. Like those kinds of communications are enormously powerful. I think the place where adults get derailed and needlessly so is that when we lay our wisdom on our teenagers, they tend to roll their eyes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we're like, you know, when they're like so-and-so's, you know, having sex with lots of people. And we're like, you know, we can do it in the gentlest way. And in a way that like thoughtful in practice, we might say, wow, that's amazing. Like, I just hope that that's what she wants. I hope she's taking good care of herself, right? So you could do it in a non-judgmental. And any self-respecting teenager is going to be like, oh gosh, oh come on, right? Like they're going to do that. Because they have to, because they need to establish their autonomy. And the weirder response would be if a teenager were like, I am so glad you brought up that value. You know, I've been thinking about that too. And I'm worried about like, they're not going to do that. And so I think we should not be the least bit put off by the eye rolling or the shrugging or the face making when we are trying to communicate our values and beliefs and wishes, that is teenagers maintaining their autonomy. I would be actually really much more curious about the kid who's like, oh, I love that you shared it that way. I'd be like, okay, that kid's up to something, like Mm -hmm. something's going on. (laughs) And so in my own home with my own adolescents, eye rolling, I translated in my mind, whatever else it is, I translated it as, I heard that. And I think that's a place to start. Yeah. Actually, one section that I really loved in your book is about why teenagers find their parents so annoying. You know, they have this visceral, like, ugh, you know, everything you do, these little things like chewing or the way you dress or something like that starts to really bother them. Why is that happening from a developmental lens? (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) I have to say, like, there's stuff you learn in grad school. There's stuff you kind of bumble through in your practice and you have your own kids and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is all much more intense and also clear to me than it used to be. And I will say that is true about age 13 is basically what I would call that whole transition. So you and I were both trained, right? Like in the idea of separation and individuation, that there are points in development where kids need to really work to establish a separate identity um, and feel themselves to be very much an individual. And I think one of the key points, so three-year-olds, and then I think one of the key points again is around age 13. And I think you could headline this this title, this time of life, like parents can't win. And the reason for that is the child is working to establish a separate identity. And I use the language in the book of like build their own brand. And it, it does kind of work to think about it in brand terms. So they're trying to build their own brand. So if there's anything that the parent does that actually matches the child's idea of their emerging brand, that is annoying to the parent, to the child. So for example, say the parent has always liked Beyonce, say the 13-year-old catches on and decides they like Beyonce. Now the 13-year-old will have a huge problem with the fact that the parent likes Beyonce because it's stepping on their emerging brand. Mm -hmm. Now the other problem though is that 
at 12 and 13, kids are still very much in, nestled in the bosom of the family, that our brains reflect on them. And so anything that the parent does that does not fit with this young person's emerging sense of their brand, this is also annoying because it's off-brand. So the sum total of this is anything we do that is like how this young person sees themselves becoming is antagonizing. Anything we do that is unlike how they see themselves becoming is antagonizing. Some total, everything we do is <laughs> annoying. <laughs> and it just stinks. It stinks for them. It stinks for us because, like, you can't breathe right. The way you know, they like, you're really going to wear those shoes and I can't believe it. And, like, why do you even ask questions like that? So, the, the solution here one is don't take it personally. This is, you can set your watch by this. Two, you can lay out parameters for behavior. You can say, look, I may be rubbing you the wrong way, but you've got three options for how to interact with me. You can be polite. You can be friendly. That'd be great. Or you can tell me you need some space, but you can't talk to me in a way that we never speak in this home. And I think the other thing you can do is you can know that it doesn't last because soon kids do start to consolidate a sense of identity. Um, I would say by age 14, you know, one of the nice things is like a lot of kids are into ninth grade. Ninth grade comes with a lot of options for how they can specialize in things or, you know, become more skilled in area interests. And so um, once kids start to get their hands around who they are and what they're about and their brand becomes more solidified, they don't mind us so much with our dowdy brands because mm, yeah. they've got their own brand worked out. Yeah. It is funny to think about that, how we know this in theory, right, that they will separate and they'll carve out their own identity, but then the way it comes out in practice is so interesting. <laughs> Not fun. Not fun right, for anybody. Right. So you have a chapter on gender differences in emotion, and I know you make it very clear it's not not everyone falls into these binary categories. It's not it's not always so straightforward, right? That these differences, you know, are so um, you know so clear between the two. But or let me put it this way: you make it clear that these gender differences in emotions are not so universal, but that there are some trends. And I actually want to I want to ask a question. It's a little more specific to typically what happens with girls and then one about boys. Um, so starting with girls, because I know, you know, you've written your two previous books are a bit more focused on girls. Um, and one of the things in the book is about how they tend to have more internalizing issues, right? Like depression and anxiety. And then under pressure, you write a lot about anxiety and stress among girls. And I've just been noticing in the media lately there's a lot of talk about this right now, um, that girls are going through so much and um, that pressure is really, I think, taking a toll on girls. Um, so I was wondering if you could just say a few words. I know you've written books about this, so there's a lot to say about it. But can you say a little bit about that with for parents who might be noticing that with their yeah. children? Yeah, no. So, you know, one of our cardinal rules in psychology is that under distress, girls are more likely to internalize and boys are more likely to externalize. So what we mean by that is girls are more likely to collapse in on themselves, boys are more likely to act out. And the collapsing in on themselves disorders are basically anxiety and depression. And we do see very high rates of anxiety and depression and rising rates in girls, and then also a bigger and bigger gap relative to boys, right? I mean, there were the CDC data that were reported in February of this year that were actually data collected in the fall of 2021, asking about mood over the previous year, which is an important asterisk to put on those data. I mean, they asked the kids, how did you feel through the pandemic? Which, shockingly, not good. Right. Um, and so we need to just note those in time. But it also reported this, this big gender difference, um, which I'm sure, and they, they, the, that report did not diagnose anxiety and depression. It just asked about low mood over a period of two weeks or more. Um and self-report. So there's something very real. Girls are reporting much more internalizing distress than boys are and needs to be taken very seriously. At the same time, those self-report measures are not asking, have you been a jerk lately? Are you taking your feelings out on other people lately? Mm -hmm. Right. The kinds of questions that are going to pick up the behaviors that we are more likely to see in boys in distress. And so part of what happens in the reporting is that girls look so bad, and I don't want to in any way minimize that. Like we want to take that, you know, take care of that. 
and, and address it very seriously. But I don't want to also say, oh, that must mean the boys look good, right? I mean, the boys, I'm sure, are suffering. Um, they may be suffering in different ways or as a result of different things. But we're not actually often asking the kinds of questions that are going to surface how boys themselves are suffering or how they're causing suffering in others as a result of their own suffering. So it's an it's a um, it's a bit of a tangle, and and I think one that um, I'm just, I just watch the discourse around it, and and I'll give you a good example of where I'm like, ooh, we got to get into these like you know more nuanced pieces. I'm hearing more and more um, of boys getting into online spaces where flagrant misogyny is the norm. You know, sort of Andrew Tate and his successors have created spaces online that are like horrendous, like absolutely like disgusting and um, unguarded, you know, unfiltered misogyny. I'm hearing that those boys are then sometimes showing up at school and like saying these things and, and just parroting this stuff, which they're saying it to girls, right? And so I think it's interesting because Though we don't, we're not asking any questions that detect the fact that this is occurring for the boys. Obviously, this is really concerning for the boys and really worrisome about like what is going on that they are there, that they are getting into this stuff. Like, what is it telling us about how they feel about themselves or masculinity? Like, we got to know. But what's interesting is that problem is probably most detected when we start to see the rising rates of depression or anxiety in girls. Um, not detected it by looking at what may be going on for boys. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because I I had made a note as I was reading about, we talk a lot about mean girls, but actually boys are much more likely to be harassing and taunting girls. And I've even experienced that a little bit with my daughters and it was handled really well by the school and that kind of thing. Um, one of my daughters experienced this um, in fifth grade and um, I actually, my thought and the question I wanted to ask you about boys is like, are there things parents should be doing to try to keep that kind of, so it's an externalizing behavior, but it does show up in like an aggressive form toward other kids. Yeah. And like the kid's suffering and he's causing suffering, right? I mean, so like, it's, a, you know, yeah. and like, so girls may be suffering, but often they are yeah. taking it out on themselves. So none of this is good. But I think, um, you know, there's another section in my book that could be titled, it's really hard to be a sixth grade boy, right? I mean, it, you know, that's really what you could have titled it. I could have titled it. And what I was looking at there is this interesting thing. And I kind of can't believe no one said this before. And it's got the longest note ever in the back of the book where I'm trying to say, like, I really did not see this anywhere in the literature. So if somebody else said it, like my fault for missing it, but here's how I'm constructing this argument. You know, there's two things that happen at once in the sixth grade. One is we see sexual harassment begin. We've always you know, as long as we've been studying it recently, noted that this is when it kicks off, which is way younger than people, I think, tend to be imagining. The other thing that's happening in the sixth grade, and and I and to make this argument, I pulled the height and weight and speed and strength data, is that sixth grade girls are by and large bigger, faster, and stronger than sixth grade boys. And it's just because they've hit puberty two years earlier on average. And so their bodies are just more developed. It is also true that this pubertal advantage is neurological as well. The sixth grade girls are able to think in more sophisticated ways. And also from the minute they hit school, school is better designed for girls. They're, you know, outpacing boys academically from day one all the way through, you know, 50th grade at this point. I mean, like we have the data. Um, and so I think I was thinking like, okay, this is really interesting. So say I'm a sixth grade boy and I'm in the averages, right? I'm hitting puberty you know, around the mean. When I go to recess, I am getting beat left and right by the girls. And then when I walk back in class, I'm getting beat left and right by the girls. Also in sixth grade, I'm starting to consolidate my sense of masculinity, which as one boy told me is basically entirely, um, you know, coalesces around the idea that there's nothing worse in the whole wide world than getting beat by a girl. And then lo and behold, sexual harassment begins at this time. And I'm like, these have got to be linked, right? That there are some boys who just, this is more than they can take. And you can sure take a girl down a few pegs if you comment on her boobs, her butt, something sexual. And I think we need to line all this up and think about mm. how are our boys doing? 
how do we help them maintain a self, sense of self-esteem through this developmental juncture that is bluntly just stacked against them? How do we handle it if they make a bad choice about how to try to maintain self-esteem? I, I don't know that we're spending time in this space. And I think for the sake of the boys and the sake of the girls, you know, not even thinking about kids who don't fit those categories, which we need to, there's work to be done. Do you have any words of wisdom for parents? I think it's typically boys, but um, who are maybe underachieving at school or just disengaging. They're just not feeling like it's important, maybe in early high school or something. They're just kind of, and, and again, I think in my experience with my friends who've experienced this, it does tend to be boys, but I wouldn't imagine that it has to be boys, but I think it's it really to tough be. for the parents and they're usually smart kids. They've just decided school's not important to me. I hear this a lot and there are some girls, but you are right. I mean, if we just like look at like what we hear anecdotally, it tends to be boys and there's reasons why it's likely to be boys. You know, so one is, you know, maturationally, we just know that they're a little bit behind the girls. And and that's, you know, largely again, like when you're talking ninth grade, you're still looking at pubertal effects. Like those are not gone. And so they don't always just have the um, perspective and thoughtfulness as a function of just still being very concrete in their thinking, again, a neurological reality, to put two and two together that the choices I'm making at 14 may limit the options I have at 18. Like they just, they, they are not always able to think in those terms. The other thing that happens far too often is that because the girls have so cornered the market on academic excellence, the boys start to feel like, you know, that's a girl thing to do, to be serious about school. And it's like uncool um, to be that. And a friend of mine who had three sons who did actually, they, these boys thrived academically, but they referred to the girls as the try hearts. And, and I think, first of all, the girls probably were overexerting themselves. Girls tend not to be very efficient. You know, they really not only do well academically, they tend to overdo well academically. And that's a lot of what I try to unpack in under pressure. But I think it's really hard if you have a, you know, still pretty concrete in his thinking 13 to 14 year old boy who's into the ninth grade and who like would really rather do other things than study hard and also doesn't want to be like those girls who are, you know, nose to the grindstone and also have such a, a huge like advantage. I mean, they're just so far, they're like coming into ninth grade, you know, basically with the skills in the organization that, um, you know, a lot of adolescent boys don't get to later. I mean, I, I can see why they're just like, I'm not going to compete with this. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say it's dumb to do, right? So it's it's tricky. And, and it's interesting. Um, in my own podcast, Ask Lisa, um, we have an episode, Rena, my colleague and I, about when should you bribe kids? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, this is one of the rare exceptions I'll make, which is like, you know, 14-year-old boys don't always get it that they are shooting themselves in the foot. And if you need to bribe them just so that they don't actually – you know, really hamstring themselves. I'm not against it. Like desperate times, desperate measures. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got to do what you got to do. Gotta do you know, like you, he may yeah. really regret this, but you know, you can't convince him of that now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we bring it back to girls, so as my girls gear up toward, they get, they're getting closer to middle school and beyond. Do you have any advice for me to try to I don't know if I can prevent it, but to, to keep them from feeling such intense pressure and anxiety that I'm hearing about, um, what, what, what advice do you have for me on that? Yeah. Um, so this is like really like probably the, my book under pressure is where I thought this most through. And, and one of the things that to me felt important and that really shaped my parenting of two daughters was to really watch for the moment when any student of any gender has a well-established work ethic. And again, big generalizations, girls tend to get this nailed down before boys do, but they're also highly conscientious male students. And usually, especially for girls, it's somewhere over the course of middle school that they really figure out how to work and to work well. As soon as that is in place, it is time to help that student of any gender become tactical in the deployment of their efforts to say to them, okay. You know how to work when the time comes. You can really put your nose to the grindstone. This is important for you to know how to do. Now, I want you to become strategic. You have one tank of gas to get you through the week. 
If you floor it on every single assignment, you're going to be on fumes before the week is out. Your job now is to start to figure out when you need to floor it and when you can coast. And they need our support to do this. They need language like tactical and strategic. If you tell them to back off, it bothers them because they're like, what are you talking about? Like, you've been praising me all this time for working like this, and now you're telling me I've been doing it wrong. So really treat it as like the next step in their evolution as students. Um, In my new book, I introduce a metaphor of school being like a mandatory buffet where we require students to eat everything on the buffet. I have no problem with that, but I don't think they need to fake it like they like it all. (laughs) Like They didn't put the the food on their plates. So I think we can have much more open and honest conversations with kids about like, look, you know, that class may not be your cup of tea. You still got to drink it, but we're here to make it more palatable to you. (laughs) Do you want me to sit next to you while you do the work? You know, how much of it do you have to do to get the grade or the mastery you want? I think there are ways that are low-hanging fruit for us to help all students feel, um, you know, more efficient in their approach to school and also um, more supported around the fact that there's a lot that we ask teenagers to do that they wouldn't have chosen if left to their own devices. And we can have open conversations about that. And teenagers are usually very appreciative of our honesty on those fronts. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that advice. And I think that's a skill that's helpful too, that many adults are working on where it's kind of prioritizing and not feeling like you have to be good at everything all the time. And, you know, sort of taking some of that pressure off. Um, it's a good skill to learn before <laughs> they're stressed out throughout the rest of their lives too. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. I had many more questions I could have asked you, but I'm aware of the time. And so I'll just have to, um, you know, save them for another time and keep consulting your books, which are terrific. Um, I highly recommend your books and your podcast. Ask Lisa to our listeners, where can people find you online and learn more? Probably the best clearinghouse is my website, which is drlisademore.com. That has everything. And then I, um, I post almost daily on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, just trying to put out content that's useful to, uh, so much to people helpful. caring for kids. Yeah. I think almost anyone look, who's, who has a teenager and is looking for advice will find something about their situation in what, you know, whether it's in your podcast or one of your books, it's there, you know, there's so many examples and, and helpful tips there. So thank you, Lisa. I really yeah. appreciate you coming on. You bet. Thanks so much for having me. Hey, Psychologist Off the Clock listeners, I'm going to guess that if you got to the end of this episode, that you also love to geek out about books in psychology. If you don't know where to store all your books and people are already complaining that you talk about this book that you're reading all the time, then why don't you join us once a month to read a book together? If you're interested in joining us, we hope you are. Just send an email to offtheclockpsych at gmail.com and we'll send you more information. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can get more psychology tips by subscribing to our newsletter and connecting with us on social media. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, and our podcast production manager, Jadine Stout-Williams. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our website, offtheclockpsych.com.